Our next speaker is, a, 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 um, I'm very proud to um, welcome him, him here today, Mr. Patrick Carton. He graduated in Queens and then he migrated south to Waterford where he runs the Hip and Groin Clinic. Mr. Patrick Carton is the expert on hip uh, in Ireland at the moment. So we look forward to his talk. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I'm going to speak to you uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum. Now you've heard how good exercise is for you. I'm going to tell you how bad sometimes too much exercise at too young an age can also be bad for your hip joints. Uh, the information included in the presentation today is uh, based on a, a large study that we've conducted on 1,021 consecutive operations on GAA athletes here in Ireland uh, who presented with symptomatic sports-related femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, and all surgeries performed in the UPMC uh, Whitfield uh, Clinic in Waterford. Uh, chronic hip injury is uh, an increasingly recognised problem uh, in our athletic population, both here in Ireland and internationally. Uh, many questions I'm asked from time to time is what is the cause of this, uh, what can be done about it, and, and why is it happening, um, and is there things that we can do to try and prevent this. Uh, Sports-related FAI is very simple. It's the progressive mechanical failure of the hip joint over time. Due to repetitive abnormal contact between the prominent acetabular rim and the femoral neck, uh, it uh, results in extra bone forming at these contact sites, uh, which, can, uh, which can be described as a cam or a pincer deformity. Uh, the progressive de bone deformity results in uh, abnormal biomechanics of the hip joint and abnormal function of the joint during sports and eventually will result in irreversible damage to the articular surface of the cartilage and in many cases will lead to premature osteoarthritis at quite a young age. It's very prevalent in young athletic males, uh, particularly those who are involved in, in uh, rapid, fast-acting field sports, uh, such as you see in the GAA, hurling uh, and football. You'd also see it in soccer and rugby and internationally, uh, American football, ice hockey, Australian football, all have similar type of a, a pattern uh, of twisting and turning, rapid acceleration, deceleration. Uh, those athletes that start uh, with very high intensity training and high intensity uh, competitive games on a regular basis from a very young age are most at risk because the, as the hip is developing through adolescence, uh, the stresses and strains of this type of, of movement in the hip uh, can produce abnormal changes to the morphology, the shape of the hip that can lead to uh, impingement. Uh, so uh, the cam and pincer deformity are the two uh, descriptive terms we use to describe the abnormal bony morphology associated with uh, impingement. The cam deformity is the most widely recognised deformity. It's easy to see on an x-ray, it's easy to measure, and therefore it, it, it appears in most of the literature uh, regarding the pathogenesis of uh, hip impingement, and, uh, and it's the, the area where most attention is paid on treatment. What a cam deformity essentially is, is a loss of offset the diameter of the head and the diameter of the neck, uh, the dif difference between them decreases. The, the, the sphericity of the femoral head is lost and becomes quite flattened at the anterolateral aspect of the hip joint. As you move the hip into flexion, into adduction and internal rotation especially, uh, that maximizes the, the contact between the, 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 uh, the femoral neck and the acetabular rim and then maximizes, uh, maximizes the damage to the articular cartilage and to the labrum, a very important structure in the hip, as time goes on. We measure, the, alpha, uh, we measure the, the size of the camera deformity using an alpha angle. What this essentially is, is uh, looking at the, um, the center of the femoral head, and we, we look at the, the central axis of the head neck, and we take the point at which the femoral head loses its sphericity, and the angle between these two lines is known as the alpha angle. That can be measured on two separate views on x-rays. A normal AP pelvis, you can measure the angle and it should be below uh, 65 degrees. On a done view, which is a, a tangential view of the femoral neck uh, taken uh, with the, the hip flexed to 90 degrees, that allows us to see the front of the femoral neck very clearly and the angle should be less than 55 degrees. So uh, this is something that is used throughout the literature to measure the, the extent and the presence of cam deformity. Pincer deformity is completely different. Pincer deformity simply implies that there is an abnormal prominence of the rim of the socket, the rim of the acetabulum. And this can be due to a deepened uh, socket where the femoral head lies quite deeply in the socket or simply a, a focal rim abnormality. But essentially the, the impingement pattern is different because you've got a prominent neck, sorry, prominent rim impacting on essentially a normal neck. And you have linear transfer of forces to the labrum which becomes progressively damaged 
and the articular cartilage again at that junction with the labrum progressively becomes damaged as well. With uh, more uh, extreme forms of pincer impingement, the femoral head toggles within the joint, it pivots, and you can get contra coup wear at the back of the hip joint. The way we measure pincer impingement is using what a term called the center edge angle. Essentially, it's the amount of cover the acetabulum has over the femoral head, and that can be measured on an AP view, which is most commonly uh, used. And you can see here the center of the femoral head and the, uh, the ileoischial line, uh, and as that, the distance becomes less and less, the femoral head becomes deeper and the angle becomes greater. So um, again, a very important, uh, the deeper the, the, the femoral head within the socket, uh, the higher the chance you have impingement and restriction of movement of your hip. Uh, that, that tends to be a more of a global uh, case of impingement we see in middle-aged ladies and, and older ladies in particular. In the younger males, uh, we see more of a pincer due to malorientation of the acetabulum. And this can be a mild malorientation. So in all, most of our bodies, are, are the, the sockets, the acetabulum face slightly forward, about 10, 12 degrees. And, uh, and as that antiversion becomes uh, uh, lessened, as, they, as, the, as the, uh, the cup in some people will become more lateralized facing, uh, then the anterior wall comes across the front of the hip and effectively blocks the movement. And we can see this on signs uh, known as the crossover sign, uh, where the anterior, wall, the anterior wall and the posterior wall cross. We can see it here where the center of the femoral head lies lateral to the posterior wall. And we can see the back of the acetabulum known as the ischial spine sign. And these are all give you indications of how much retroversion, how much backward facing the angle of the cup is. Over the last five years, we've paid particular attention to uh, the anterior center edge angle. This is an angle that you measure that will give you an indication of how much the acetabulum covers the front of the hip. And to me, this is much more important in our young athletes uh, than this, the lateral center edge angle. And uh, again, you can see uh, just how much of this large pincer deformity at the front of the hip will cause some degree of blocking of forward flexion of the hip joint. And uh, so uh, we're now paying a lot of attention to this in our work. Pathogenesis. Uh, is very controversial. How does cam deformity and how does a, a pincer deformity develop? Well, again, a lot of the focus, because you can see a cam deformity very clearly, has focused on the cam uh, uh, pathogenesis. And the original team that described femoral acid impingement in Switzerland, Reinhold Gantz's team, uh, also came up with a, a, an explanation as to why the cam forms. And they felt it was due to an extension of the growth plate due to compressive pressures during sports. So as you're playing sports over a long period of time during adolescence and childhood, the compression on your growth plate stimulates the growth plate to grow uh, anteriorly, forming this bump called cam deformity. And uh, this was published as early as 2004. And what they also uh, as, uh, indicated was that when the growth plate fuses, then the cam deformity no longer gets any bigger because it's a growth plate abnormality. So therefore, a uh, cam develops in the adolescence and doesn't get any bigger. It causes this damage once it forms. Uh, the, our research, uh, looking at uh, almost 1,800 athletes, uh, 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 shows something completely different. And uh, this has been accepted for publication only two weeks ago in the HIP International. And they, well, we have noticed that as our athletes get older, the prevalence and the size of the cam deformity gets bigger. And uh, so therefore, uh, the, the younger you are, the less chance you have of cam deformity. And because it's progressive, uh, over uh, with increasing athletic age and the longer you're playing sports, then this is not a growth plate abnormality. It's most likely a secondary problem. And we focus then on the acetabulum, and we notice that the acetabulum, as you get older in sports, doesn't change. The morphology doesn't change with respect to the center edge angle, with respect to the cover. Therefore, it's static. And we believe that the acetabulum is the primary growth problem in FAI in sports, and that this, the cam deformity is actually a secondary phenomenon. And this, this a, a change in the idea of pathogenesis is something very new, and certainly will, will cause a little bit of discussion when it's published, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. Um, the, reasons that we believe this is because when you're playing sports, uh, the ligaments and the capsule are constantly being pulled, and, and uh, especially during hyperextension, during running, uh, with twisting and turning, and internal and external rotation, you've got significant forces being pulled across your iliofemoral ligament. And the iliofemoral ligaments and the anterior labrum, which is under enormous pressure, attach to this os acetabuli at the front of the hip joint. This is in a growing uh, patient, and uh, you see the growth plate here. And this constant pull will, will allow the growth bit to form uh, more prominently. And as you develop this prominence, it then will cause rubbing and abrasion of the femoral neck, which will then stimulate your bone and stimulate your cam deformity. 
So we believe that it's a focal rim over coverage that causes the problems in these young athletes and not a cam deformity. Uh, so therefore, when it comes to treatment, the most important thing is to treat the rim abnormality and only the cam abnormality if it's present. So as you see here in this young patient, the growth plate is very clearly a, a deep inside the hip joint during flexion and this prominent rim of the acetabulum is causing impact on the femoral neck. So this is the principle that we believe and, and it certainly has observed in almost 1800 uh, of our athletic cases. Uh, we also believe that the anterior capsule in the iliofemoral ligament will cause abrasion during twisting and turning uh, to the uh, femoral neck which can also stimulate bone growth. So how does impingement present? So when you are uh, at your clinic or, and somebody comes in and, is, uh, uh, and you're querying whether they have impingement, it's important to be able to uh, take a good history and examine the patient for this. Um, history of inflexibility. Even as young as 14, 15 years of age, patients will come in and say, I, I'm inflexible compared to some of my teammates. I have tight hamstrings. And, uh, and this is something which rings alarm bells in my head straight away. Uh, often these patients, they'll present with an increasing reduction in range of, of movement in one or both hips, stiffness after activity, dull progressive groin pain, uh, catching, clicking, stabbing type groin pain with twisting and turning, and aching around the hip joint. Uh, the uh, Warwick Agreement, uh, uh, an international consensus statement published two years ago, indicated that there was one primary symptom of hip impingement and that was pain. In our series, we've shown that there are actually two primary hip symptoms. Uh, one is pain, which was present in 76% of our athletes before, before uh, surgery. And uh, uh, number two was a, a post-activity stiffness, often lasting hours or a day, is an enormously important symptom. And the reason why it's important is because it's something that most athletes feel it's a normal thing, that they should be stiff after training in their hips. And it's not true. Um, so commonly misdiagnosed as a, a, a FAI is commonly misdiagnosed as osteitis pubis, as Gilmore's groin, sports hernia, adductor groin strains, although these obviously do occur. It's important if you are assessing somebody for these that you look at the hip joints because often there's an underlying FAI that's putting enormous pressure on some of these structures that can bring on secondary uh, symptoms. How do you test for impingement? There are two things you need to look for. Number one is the range of, of passive hip movement. And we do this in our clinic always with two people, uh, one person examining the hip passively and the second person measuring the range of movement with a handheld goniometer. Uh, the hip movement uh, versus an age gender matched population with our patients showed there was almost it was over a 10 degrees uh, reduction in a, a preoperative a mean flexion, straight line flexion. There was a reduction in adduction uh, of uh, almost five degrees and uh, there was a, a significant reduction in internal rotation uh, of over 10 degrees. And these are clinically significant uh, differences when you come to this sort of level. So it's important also to look at the impingement test, uh, flexing the hip uh, into 90 degrees, adducting, internal rotating, uh, also will demonstrate uh, that it's positive in about 70% of our athletes. So it's very sensitive for hip pathology, but it's not quite sensitive for impingement, but it's a very important test to do. Everybody comes to the clinic, it needs to have investigations to, to be able to confirm your diagnosis. Uh, we perform what's called an impingement x-ray series. It involves three x-rays, a simple AP pelvis, all taken standing up uh, to show any, any differences in the joint spaces between sides. On the AP pelvis, you can measure the cam deformity using the alpha angle. You can measure the over coverage using the center edge angle. And uh, they, we also perform the done view and the false private view. These are specialist views which allow us to look at the front of the neck of the femur, uh, specifically for cam deformity, and the front of the acetabular rim, especially in our young athletes looking for pincer deformity, uh, just coming over the front of the femoral neck and head. Every uh, patient who comes to the clinic suspected of FEI will get an MR arthrogram. It's important that you use contrast in the hip joint. A normal MRI scan is, is not useful in my view. Uh, you need to be able to see filling defects within the hip joint, the, uh, the outline, of, and, 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 uh, outline of the labrum. You can see the labrum here is, is quite large. It's separated from the acetabular rim and with an underlying pincer form, that pointed uh, bony deformity beneath the labrum uh, is important uh, from a treatment perspective that you see that. How does FEI affect athletic performance? This is something that is uh, not widely looked at in the literature. And uh, so um, it's very important, when, especially when players are symptomatic uh, mid-season. They want to try and continue playing through the season. If they do need the surgery, it would be ideal to do it at the end of the season. They want to know how does it affect their performance. If you have two or three symptomatic athletes on your team, it may affect your team performance. Uh, so we uh, looked at two groups. Uh, we looked at a group of athletes who are due to have surgery. And we compared that with a group of athletes 
who uh, were uh, healthy, aged, and activity matched controls. And what we found is when we looked at uh, a number of internationally validated performance tests, such as the agility test and the sprint test that you've just seen, and looking at the level of deep squat, and uh, also the reactive strength index with a single hop jump uh, and range of movement, we found that there was a significant difference between the groups. There was a loss of speed, agility, a reduced squat depth, pain during testing, and significant reduced range of movement in our athletic group in the symptoms or patients who have symptoms of FAI. And this, uh, if you want to read more about this, uh, you can read it in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine that was published last year. How important is treating hip impingement? Obviously, there are two different ways of treating hip impingement. There's the conservative route and the surgical route. Uh, and this is where it becomes controversial between myself and, and, and maybe many of the physiotherapists in the room. Um, conservative management. Uh, I do believe conservative management is very important because people do present from time to time with pain and, uh, and stiffness, and it can be managed conservatively. They do not need surgery in every case. Uh, certainly, a, a period of rest with activity modification, avoidance of aggravating factors such as uh, squatting, a, a lun deep lunging, anything that overloads or, or overcovers the front of the hip that puts pressure on the labrum should be avoided to give the labrum a chance to settle down if it has been caught. Uh, avoid extremes of movement when people are symptomatic. Avoid overstretching the hip joint because that will just uh, increase the pressure on the impingement, on the pressure on the labrum and will ma a, a make it less difficult for the symptoms to settle. Address muscle tightness, address your core mu uh, muscle imbalance and core strength and optimize the functional mobility, the mobility of the hip joint within a comfort zone, until, and that comfort zone will improve as the patient then settles. Um, the, again, back to the, the Warwick consensus in 2016, which is something that, that is, is quoted quite a lot. Um, three months of physiotherapy has been recommended for any new uh, symptoms in, in athletes and, or, or, or recreation athletes as well. And that's something that, that we uh, agree with in our clinic. And uh, we would certainly never operate on anybody with at least uh, a minimum of three to four months where they've had a, a physiotherapy uh, to try and deal with the symptoms. Steroids, uh, I'm completely against steroids in the joint in these young athletes. Uh, steroids uh, are, are, are int introduced with a needle. It's a straight needle and it's a round joint. It inevitably will cause some iatrogenic damage to the cartilage. Sepsis can be introduced, which will be an absolutely devastating effect for these young uh, athletes. And steroids will, uh, in many cases, work. They will help mask the symptoms, allow the athletes to get back playing, but they will be unaware of the increased damage they're doing to their hips as they won't be able to feel the results of that. And therefore, they will lead to ir increased irreversible damage to the cartilage if you keep playing and keep introducing steroids. What is the evidence to support physiotherapy and what is the evidence to support surgery regarding treatment FAI? Uh, at, at the moment, there is very little evidence uh, uh, looking at objective outcome uh, a, a following physiotherapy for FAI. And it's an area that the physiotherapists uh, will, I'm sure, be working on. But at the moment, there's only a, really three or four papers that, that show outcomes after physiotherapy. And according to the grade recommendations, they are very poor quality and a very poor methodology. So it's difficult to get a, an understanding of the effect of, that, uh, of those papers by Emmer and Hunt. Uh, the, the patients involved in the papers were not athletes, and most of them didn't have impingement. Surgical intervention, there's no doubt there's an enormous body of evidence that supports surgical treatment of FAI. There is criticism of the level of evidence that we have. Most of these uh, uh, studies are long uh, case studies from individual surgeons like, like myself, uh, a lot of prospective and retrospective case control studies. Uh, but these are at the best we have at present, at present, and they do teach us a lot about the success of surgery, even up to five and ten years. Um, we have been waiting on a, a number of randomized controlled trials to look at the effect of conservative versus surgical management, um, and a number of those have been published this year. Uh, Mansell et al., a military uh, a surgeon, uh, published uh, two-year results looking at conservative treatment versus uh, surgery, and found there was no difference at two years. Uh, the, uh, this was published in a very respected journal, the American Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, but has been highly criticized because of the poor methodology. The high crossover, uh, an awful lot of patients left the physiotherapy group and actually underwent surgery. Uh, and this, uh, uh, the, the, the power of this uh, uh, change in um, circumstance wasn't expressed in the paper. And the surgeon, unfortunately, was very inexperienced, had only performed 100 of these cases uh, before undertaking the, the, the trial, and the surgical results were extremely poor compared to national, uh, international standards. So uh, it's very difficult to take a lot from that paper. 
the fashion trial published by Damien Griffin in The Lancet, uh, again, uh, shows at one year, and the FATE trial also from Reading shows at one year, that surgery has a statistically and a clinically significant better outcome than physiotherapy. But this is early. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the most important outcome is, is more of a longer term outcome, two and five years. But uh, certainly at the minute, uh, there, there's increasing evidence that surgery does have an increasing role to play in the treatment of FAI. I treat all my FAI patients with, uh, with arthroscopic means, uh, and the goal uh, is to achieve an impingement range of movement, impingement-free range of movement uh, uh, at the end of the procedure. So re assessing the range of movement before and after the procedure is extremely important. This is a, 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 a impingement, a, a, all aspects of impingement. You've got a cam, you've got a large pincer, you've got a, a bit of the, the pincer broken off, known as a rim fracture, and this is following the surgery. You see the difference in the mechanical obstruction to the movement that you'd expect compared to once all of those deformities are removed. A cam deformity, uh, again, 72% seven, of our players uh, have a cam deformity at the time of surgery. And the cam deformity, uh, I'll just show you how we remove that briefly, uh, using a, a, prob a, a mechanical burr approximately half a centimetre wide. We remove all of the excessive bone on the femoral neck. Uh, we rotate the, the hip during movement. We do this under x-ray to ensure we've got our boundaries. And we're changing that convexity back into a concavity, re-establishing the offset of the neck. This is a dynamic assessment of the, uh, the hip as we're just moving the hip both into internal rotation to ensure that there's no impingement. Uh, again, the pincer deformity always needs corrected. As I, I believe that the pincer is the primary driver in impingement. Therefore, the acetabular rim needs to be addressed in every case. Uh, and you see here uh, the, the change in the lateral center edge angle from removing the pincer, uh, and you can imagine the amount of improved range of movement this uh, athlete will have following this sur surgery. Again, using a smaller burr, a four millimeter burr, we remove the, the prominence on the front of the acetabulum. Uh, it comes out almost semicircular, the prominence, and we've got to try and get that a nice flat face across the acetabulum so there's no um, a block to movement. This is a cyst. Uh, that is a, a paralabral cyst that is developed uh, because of tearing uh, in the cartilage just beneath this. And uh, this is a 27-year-old footballer. So that, and that's the, 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 the pincer deformity completely removed. Um, the labrum is an extremely important structure. And, th and often this is where we get a lot of the pain from during impingement. Uh, we believe that in every case the labrum should be repaired, it should be preserved. Uh, unfortunately, there's still many surgeons who are debriding and excising the labrum, uh, despite uh, numerous reports showing that labral repair is superior. Um, uh, we've developed our own technique of repairing the labrum called the labral cuff technique, and we've been using this on, mainly on our GA athletes over many years. And uh, this was published last year in the Interna International Journal of Hip Preservation Surgery, if anybody wants to read that technique. Uh, this is a, a standard labral repair technique uh, using uh, a drill we put in two anchors, uh, the labrum we have to take down to access the rim of the acetabulum, and then we've got to put the labrum back again when we're finished, and simply just passing sutures through around, uh, or in our cuff technique, using the edge of the labrum to, to pull it back up again, uh, is a way of re-establishing uh, the, the continuity of the labrum with the bone. And uh, a very important element uh, to the surgery. Capture repair is something that has been uh, recently causing um, uh, a lot of discussion as to uh, we should, should we not be repairing the capsule. Capsule repair does take an extra 15, 20 minutes per case. So if you're doing many of these cases per week, it can reduce your, 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 your output. Um, a, in 2013, we started routinely repairing the capsule and have done so since then. Uh, and, we, and we presented our results between two groups, the capsule repair group and the unrepaired capsule group. And we found in the unrepaired capsule that uh, there was a, 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 it seemed to me, a, no limit almost to um, uh, internal rotation in some of these patients. And uh, when we started repairing the capsule, we got a much uh, more finite uh, limit to the internal rotation. And we do believe it makes a big difference with stability. Uh, the outcomes didn't appear to be any different at two years, but I do expect in the longer term it will make enormous difference. So despite the, the, the time tick, we still, we still use it. So what are the results of the surgery in this uh, 1,021 cases? Um, there's been a significant, highly significant improvement at two and five years uh, of all the patients who, who've, who've been measured uh, in all of the validated outcome scores that we commonly use to assess improvement in hip function and general well-being. The range of movement has improved uh, six degrees in flexion, uh, 3.3 degrees on average in adduction, and 8.6 degrees in internal rotation, which is the main uh, a, a movement that becomes limited with impingement. So we're re-establishing re that very well. 
Athletic performance, uh, we back to our, our two groups that we showed that there was a significant difference in athletic performance. A year after surgery, uh, there was no difference between these groups. So we, have, we were able to restore the athletic performance in our, in our group of uh, uh, athletes, uh, increasing their speed and agility again, getting them back uh, with good range of movement, improving their squat depth, and reducing pain during the testing. And that uh, paper is due to be submitted actually in the next couple of weeks. Satisfaction between 91 and 95% of our athletes in this a series of 1,000 uh, cases felt that the surgery was effective in leaving the pain, uh, able to perform regular activities and back in performing sports activities. Three quarters of these patients said they would definitely have surgery again on the other side if they had a similar problem, 15% uh, uh, unsure. Uh, the biggest problem is delay in diagnosis. We looked at the outcome uh, in patients who had symptoms for up to two years versus those who had symptoms over two years, and there was a highly significant difference in outcome between those two groups, even though both groups were very successful. So it means that we need to, to treat this ideally less than two years, uh, so people having long-term symptoms is not good because it causes damage like this. Uh, this is articular cartilage damage in the 17-year-old hurler. You can see the damage in the cartilage is much more extensive in this x-ray. Uh, this is delamination, exposed subchondral bone. This is irreversible and will, 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 this hip will fail. And this 25-year-old inter-county hurler um, uh, from County Louth came down and uh, uh, this was the, the state of his hip and uh, he will need a hip replacement most likely in the next couple of years. Uh, when patients uh, come to the clinic and they are too late, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do with regards to preservation uh, and hip replacement remains being the only option when the symptoms get to that level. In summary, uh, we've introduced a new concept to the pathogenesis of hip impingement, and uh, hopefully this will cause a lot of discussion over the next uh, six months. Um, early recognition is very important. If, as physiotherapists and sports doctors, you come across this and you're treating it and you feel you're not getting anywhere, it's important to refer it on quickly so the treatment can be instigated quickly to get a, a, these hips preserved uh, rather than uh, irreversible damage. Let's leave you with uh, one last uh, slide showing a patient of ours eight months after hip arthroscopy. This young athlete was uh, 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 influential in, in Claire winning the Royal Iron final that year. And, uh, it's very good to see that as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed.